Good morning and welcome to uh, Redeemer Fellowship this morning. One of our commitments at Redeemer Fellowship is to make sure first things stay first. And part of that is to make sure we're focused on the Lord Jesus, who is the center. You know, uh, there was a line that we sang, and uh, it was in the second verse when it says, Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ. I live. There was a major, pretty liberal denomination that was putting together a new hymnal. And they wanted to include this hymn in it, but they didn't like one of the lines in it. And they wanted that line to read, Till on that cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. For I am his and he is mine. Here in the death of Christ I live. And it put Keith Getty and Stuart Townsend in an interesting place because what that's true. Till on the cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son a propitiation for our sins. But they wouldn't allow them to change the verse. Not so much that it was wrong to say the love of God was magnified, but that it was wrong to miss the central part of the gospel, that God is rightly angry at our sins, and his holiness depends a payment for that. And God's holy nature couldn't simply ignore our sin and dismiss it. He needed to be righteous, as Paul puts it in the book of Romans, the just and the justifier, the one who could declare us righteous through faith in Jesus. And so the Bible uses the word, and it's one of those Protestant Latin words, propitiation. And it means satisfied. That Every demand that God has against us because of our sin, when Christ took our sins on himself, as it were, God pronounced our account paid in full, satisfied with what has been done by the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we come to the table this morning, that's what we are celebrating. We are not reenacting the Lord's death. We are remembering what has been done and accomplished for us. As the Lord Jesus said as he died, it is finished. And we remember the death of Christ once for all in our place and on our behalf. So we're going to uh, take the bread and the wine as he, the cup as he asked us to in remembrance of him. We'll uh, distribute them and then we'll take them together after they are distributed. While they're being distributed, there's a very little, simple little chorus that just celebrates the, uh, the Lamb of God and we will uh, sing that together. It's one of those that repeats itself a lot and I know at a certain point, I know in my life, I'll just listen to the rest of it if you get sung out on repeating the, the words of praise to the Lord. Um, but let's give the Lord thanks for this reminder that we stand in Christ alone. Father, thank you for what you accomplished when you gave your son for us. We come to you as the one before whom the angels bow, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We hear Peter confronted with the majesty of Jesus saying, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. But we also hear the words of invitation. Come. All that my son has done has opened the door and made a way to me. I'm fully satisfied in what he, he has done on your behalf. So we come to take these simple symbols of such a profound and wonderful truth that you, our God, gave your son as the propitiation from our, for our sins.
so that we might stand and sit forgiven in your presence, celebrating our fellowship with one another, and especially with your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray and give thanks. Amen. One day we will be in heaven before you, saying, worthy is the Lamb. As we take this bread, we remember John the Baptist saying, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because you bore our sins in your body on the cross. We take this bread in remembrance and give you thanks. And this cup, which reminds us of the gift of your life poured out in sacrifice. And thank you. In you we have redemption through your blood, the forgiveness of sins. We take this cup and give thanks in remembrance of you. Father, we come as a group of your children and uh, we thank you that you have opened the door and invited us to come with our needs and our burdens and our concerns. You've told us that we are to remember that we are a care to you, that you care about us. And you know the individual things that are on our hearts. Some of us are bringing some heavy things that are even too private to share. We pray for uh, Darwin and Sharon. We pray for the specific issues of pain and the ability to eat. We uh, entrust them to you. Help them in the middle of what they are going through to cling even to some of those verses that we read. When you pass through deep waters, they will not overwhelm you and you pass through fiery trials. My grace is sufficient. We pray for Susan you, and we ask that your spirit would minister grace into her life. We pray for our country at a time of significant challenges and needs. And we pray that there might be a turning not to politicians, but to you as our only hope. Use our time as we think about you from your word. Glorify yourself through it. In Christ's name, amen. One of my favorite stories is about a Greek scholar named E.V. Ryu. Back in the 1950s, uh, there were not very many sort of modern translations of the New Testament. King James was still very dominant, and Penguin Books decided that they wanted to do a translation of the New Testament. So they approached a man named E.V. Ryu, who was actually the head of Penguin Classics. He'd translated Homer, translated the Odyssey, the Iliad. They'd become relative bestsellers within the classical world, and they asked him to do a translation of the, uh, of the New Testament, of the Gospels. And this would be pioneering this translation of the New Testament. Ryu was a Greek scholar, but he was a lifelong agnostic, had no interest in spiritual things, and, uh, and yet he took on the assignment as a challenge to him as a Greek scholar. And when they heard of it, one of his sons wrote to another son. He said, um, it will be interesting to see what father does with the Gospels it will be even more interesting to see the, what the Gospels do to Father. That was a wonderful insight. Because the truth is, a year later, this man was baptized as a convinced Christian. He'd come to faith as a follower of the Lord Jesus by translating the Gospels. And he said in his preface to his translation, my work changed me. I'm became convinced that these bear the seal of the Son of God and the Son of Man. 
and they are the Magna Carta of the human spirit. The writer of Hebrews says the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. And uh, some of us have felt that in our own lives as we come to realize somebody, another translator of the New Testament said that he felt when he was translating the New Testament like an electrician uh, wiring a building with the electrical mains not having been turned off. It was always this sense of power surging through and it needed to be dealt with with great care but with great wonder. And that's critical, an understanding of what kind of book the Bible is. We're talking about firm foundations and uh, a church needs to have a clear sense of exactly what kind of book the Bible is, what God intended it for and what it does. Our statement reads like this. We believe that God has spoken through the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments. As the God-breathed word of God, the Bible is without error in the original writings, the complete revelation for his will for salvation sufficient for all that God requires us to believe and to do. It is therefore the ultimate authority for his people. It is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. And the reason we believe that ultimately is because that's what the Lord Jesus believed. If he is the son of God, and his resurrection makes that clear, then we want to believe what he believed about the Bible and what he taught us to believe. So this morning, we're going to look at a passage of scripture that uh, thinks through or helps us think through what exactly the Bible is. And it's found in the last letter that Peter ever was to write to a group of Christians, the book of 2 Peter. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to 2 Peter, and we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 12 to 21. It's probably useful to know that he's writing this in the 60s. And in the 60s, Nero is now the emperor in Rome. Peter is in Rome. And before very long, there is going to be a great fire that's going to destroy Rome and to, or much of the city of Rome, and to uh, shift blame away from himself. Nero will blame it on the Christians. And in the light of that, um, Peter will be executed as a criminal. Tradition says he was fleeing the city and the Lord appeared to him and stopped him and said, Peter, where are you going? And in effect said, go back and care for your people. Don't abandon them in the midst of it. Now, whether that tradition is true or not, we don't know. But we do know that even as we read these words, you'll see the awareness of his approaching death is very much on Peter's mind. So 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. Therefore, I intend to remind you of these qualities. And he's described the promises and the requirements of a believer's life. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. He literally writes the present truth, the truth that is present with us. I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall. The word is again, remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We also heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. And the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, or as of first importance, that no prophecy of Scripture ever comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
Now, Paul's writing this group of Christians, and his great concern is going to be made clear as we get into chapter 2 and chapter 3. We'll uh, get there and talk about it. But there's really kind of three things that I want you to notice. First of all, in verses 12 to 15, Paul is talking out of his own experience to say that the, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, and Elizabeth's going to be correcting me all through because I always get mixed up and she's always gracious enough to point me to the right thing. So I end up calling Peter Paul and Paul Peter. And um, anyway, it's a bad joke, but it's my mind that goes uh, off here. Verses 12 to 15, he wants to talk about the purpose of the letter, but in the large sense, the larger purpose of Scripture. And the purpose of Scripture is to remind us of the truth that God has revealed. Now, he's writing to a group of Christians who are uh, living and we're not precisely sure what their location of is, but he knows two things about them. The first is, that he knows that they are genuine believers. They have come to faith and trust in Jesus. Notice how the book begins. Simeon or Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing, equally valuable with ours. Now, that's something that's worth just pausing to think about. Peter was one of the apostles. He'd walk with Christ. He'd had all these experiences. These others, they were people who'd never witnessed firsthand what they'd witnessed. But he says, their faith is equally valuable as ours. Because the value of faith isn't the person who has the faith. It's the object of the faith that makes it valuable. And the object of the faith was the Lord Jesus Christ. And they have a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And he'll come back to that idea in verse 8. And he talks about growing and not being ineffectual or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these are people who know Christ personally. One of the last things he will say in the book is grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are genuine believers. They know the truth. They know who Christ is. And then you'll notice in the verses we read in verse, um, in verse 12, he says, you know these things and you have, are established in the truth. So these are people who, Paul says, or Peter says, you're grounded in the truth. You've got a foundation underneath you. That was one of the terms my father used to use all the time. And we'd be talking about somebody and uh, he would say, oh, he's well grounded, which meant he's reliable. He knows the truth. He's got his, a grip on what the truth is. He's not a novice. He's well grounded. And Peter is saying, you're grounded in the truth. You have stability. But he says, you're living in a time where there's going to be challenges coming your way. One challenge is, I'm about to die. Now, part of the reason he knows he's going to die, and he's going to die a death that he didn't plan, is because in John chapter 21, Jesus said, Peter, when you're older, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. And he talks about his death at the hands of violence. And, and he, he senses in some intuitive way, my death is approaching. And in the light of my death, I just want to write to remind you. So one of the deaths, one of the issues was his own death. By the way, it's interesting to think about well, how he describes his death. There's two metaphors he uses, and it's useful for us to think about them. You'll notice in verse um, 14, he says, Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. And the word he uses is a putting off is a word that means is used for two things. First of all, taking off clothing. And the other is of striking a tent. You know, taking down the tent to move on elsewhere. And if you're taking off a body, that means there's something deeper than the body that's there. 
to put off the body was to still go into the presence of the Lord. And he writes in that particular way. And then another term he uses in verse 15, I will make every effort so that after my departure, but the word there is a word that you're familiar with, after my exodus. Now think of what the image of an exodus is. The image of the exodus is you're leaving a place which in some way is a place of bondage to go to the promised land. It was the same word that was described of the death of Jesus. So for Peter, as he describes his death, it's not the end. It's the means by which the tent is going to be replaced. He's going to strike, tent and, uh, strike his tent and go home. It's his departure for the land that God has promised to us. So while his death is a challenge to these Christians, for Peter, he's not looking at it as a terrible thing. He's looking at it as the entrance into what God has promised. Now, the second issue was not only his approaching death, but the presence of false teachers. So in chapter 2 and verse 1, he says... False teachers also rose among the people, and there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord. So the second problem was that there were false teachers who were peddling their agenda, and they were sophisticated, and they were clever, and their agenda was to uh, introduce a pattern of immorality. If we had the time to go through chapter 2, he, what their intention was, was that Christians would be convinced that moral standards didn't matter and you could live as you desired. So they're going to come under the loss of Peter as their leader. And I mean, you think of what that must have meant. They're linked to the, to the person of Christ. Their physical direct link and he's going to be gone. Not because he was the Pope, but because he was an apostle sent by the Lord. This onslaught, which was already being experienced to false teachers, and the third thing that was going to happen was persecution was going to come down on their head. So Paul is writing to say, your feet are planted. Your feet are planted. But there is going to come pressures, and there is going to come an onslaught. There's going to come a wind even more powerful than the one that was rushing through here yesterday. Uh, the last couple of days, we've had these great winds moving through. Or you think of the uh, earthquakes in Japan or the one in Ecuador just yesterday. And you think of buildings that just collapsed under the midst of that. And that's what Peter is saying. You need to, live, to have a quake-proof experience. And what I am going to do is I am going to write to you to remind you, to remember. So you'll notice how important that is in this particular context. He repeats the word, I intend always to remind you. And the way he's going to do that is he's writing scripture. And then he says in verse 13, I think it right as long as I'm in the body to stir you up by way of reminder. And then in verse 15, after my departure, you may be at any time able at any time to remember these things. Then in chapter 3, in verse 1, he'll come back to that. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your pure mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So what Paul is saying, Peter is saying is that in the coming storm, what you need is to be reminded of what is eternal and not overwhelmed by what is present. And scripture is God's way of reminding us of God's given truth. We never go beyond the Bible. The movement that says back to the Bible is always the right movement for Christians. The second thing then he wants to talk about is the reliability of God's word, that it is grounded in history. Now, you'll notice in verse, 15, uh, verse 16, he begins by saying, we did not tell you cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Almost certainly, and, and we know it's true because of chapter 3, this reflects the fact that the false teachers were coming in and they were saying, 
you know, um, a, a lot of what you've been taught is cleverly contrived fables. And they may have a spiritual truth, they may have a spiritual reason behind them, but they're not things that you can anchor your foot on. They are passing ideas. And the specific issue was the second coming of Christ. So he says, we haven't followed cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the issue that central is the second coming of Christ. Is Christ really going to come again? If we were to turn to chapter 3, he would talk about people and say, where's the promise of his coming? And he'll launch into that in this particular section. So the, Peter's central issue now is we need to understand what you open when you open the book of Scripture to enlarge it, and he'll enlarge his teaching in a minute, is that it isn't cleverly invented myths. Now, quite frankly, that's the issue that we still face today. The Bible, we're told in a number of different directions, is the product of a primitive worldview. It doesn't have the benefit of our scientific knowledge. And it is a mythological understanding of what is there. And th there, are, there are gems in the middle of it, but uh, there's also a lot of stuff that we just need to discard. I was reading or watching something this morning, even just before I came over, clicked on something and they were talking about one of the mainline churches in which their picture is to say, you know, we need to think of the Bible as having three buckets. And the first bucket is there are things in it that are eternal truths and they represent the eternal will of God. And then there's a second bucket and that represents things that used to be his will, but they aren't his will any longer. And then there's another bucket, and that's just composed of things that never were. They were just stuff that was in there that never should have been in there. And uh, the point of that is, is pretty clear, because especially right now, the whole issue of gender and sexuality, um, well, people used to believe that, but, and maybe it used to be an eternal truth, but now it's in this bucket that we know that we can dispose. And you can understand how that works in lots of other ways. Well, people used to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. We can dispose of that. He was a special person, and so forth. And, and, and that idea that these are cleverly devised myths, but we can choose. And so you think of the Jesus seminar that has uh, sort of gone through and scissor pasted the whole, scissors and pasted the whole New Testament so that what actually is genuine comes down to what this particular group votes on to say that. And so the Bible doesn't have any authority in that large measure. We have the authority and we pick and choose what we want. And Peter says, you need to understand two things. We weren't into cleverly devised myths. The first thing is we were eyewitnesses. And he goes to the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's thinking about that moment when he and Peter and John were in the, pre and James were in the, he, he is Peter, uh, when he and James and John were in the presence of the Lord and all of a sudden two others accompanied him and Jesus was transfigured and his glory ended in his power. And what Peter wants us to understand and what all the gospel writers want us to understand is that that was a kind of pre-enactment of the second coming of Christ. In other words, that was the moment when the glory that Jesus will bring with him when he comes was for a brief moment present on that mountain. And Peter's response to those who claim this is, this is uh, cleverly devised myths is, first of all, we were eyewitnesses. You notice how he puts it in, in the statement. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, his glory. For he received honor and glory from God the Father. So we saw his glory. And then secondly, we were not only eyewitnesses, we were ear witnesses. The voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. 
What he is saying is we are talking about what we saw and what we heard, not what we invented, not what we speculated, not what we got into room and thought through. We are ear witnesses and eyewitnesses because the Christian message is grounded in verifiable history witnessed to by credible witnesses who, in the final analysis, were to give their lives because they were so utterly convinced of the truth of what they had seen and heard. And it's interesting when he quotes, and we don't have time to go into all of this, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Even God the Father is quoting scripture. He's quoting Psalm 2 and verse 7 and Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1, both of which say that he is God's son and he is God's Messiah and God the Father was bearing witness to the second coming of Christ. So, Peter's first said, the purpose of scripture is to remind us of God-given truth. Secondly, the reliability of scripture is that it is based on verifiable history witnessed by real flesh and blood people. Thirdly, he will say in verses 19 to 21, Scripture's authority comes because it is the product of God's special work in the lives of people. Now, verse 19 begins with an interesting statement, and scholars have battled with this one. So you'll notice in the English Standard Version, it reads, we have the prophetic word, excuse me, I need my help here. We have something more sure, the prophetic word. Now let me just speak for a little bit about that. When he's talking about the prophetic word, and he'll repeat that again in verse 20, no prophecy of scripture comes from anyone's own interpretation. And in verse 21, again, prophecy was never produced, but men spoke from God, by the will of men, men spoke from God. He is talking about written scripture, ultimately. And he is saying, as the Jews said, they believe that every part of the Old Testament was written by someone who was a prophet, sent from God, from Moses, who was the greatest of the prophets. And then the next section of things that we look at as history. So we read 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and those other books, but the Jews included them under what they called the Nebaim, the prophets, because they believed that they were all written by prophets. And then you have the third part of the Old Testament, the writings, which they also believed were given by the Holy Spirit. Now it's interesting just to anticipate here, Peter is talking about the Old Testament primarily. But look ahead to chapter 3 and verse 2. And he says in chapter 3, in the middle of verse 1, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So all of a sudden he has put the writings of the apostles on the same level as the Old Testament prophets. And then if you look down in chapter, 50, or chapter 3 verse 15, it says, count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these things. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own instruction as they do the other scriptures. So now Peter has said the apostles of the Lord Jesus are on the same level as the Old Testament prophets, and Paul is on the same level as all the other scriptures. And so really what he is talking about here is written scripture, what we have when we hold in our hands the Bible. Now, going back to verse 19. He says, we have something more sure, the prophetic word. That's one way it's translated in the, uh, in, in the uh, English Standard Version. And it's an acceptable way of translating. And what that would mean is, we have something even more sure than our experience on the mountain. 
it's written scripture. Or another way of translating it is the way the New International Version translates it. We have the prophetic scriptures made more sure. And if Paul means, Peter means that, then what he's saying is, we have the prophetic scriptures. And then we have Christ appearing and we saw his glory. So we've got what God promised in the Old Testament and now we've seen a foretaste of it. And that only confirms what is already sure. It just makes it more sure. You know, there's a time in our relationship, I remember it very well with Elizabeth, in which you are, um, not formally, but engaged to be engaged. We were talking about marriage. We were talking, I know I told her, I can't even imagine life without you. And we would talk about marriage. And I'm sure she believed that I was utterly serious. I, my word was sure. I think she knew pretty clear. But then there was a day in which I said, uh, there's something in that glove box in the car that you might. And she picked it out, and there was the engagement ring. And now the marriage word was made more sure. And then there was when I said, and her father conducted the ceremony, I do. And it was made absolutely sure. Now, it may be that what Peter is saying is that, that the reality of what happened in Christ, but whatever his point is, the prophetic word is sure. It is absolutely reliable. It is absolutely certain. And it is intended by God as a lamp shining in a murky place until the... Uh, Dawn breaks and the day star arises in your heart. Now think about that. God's word is a lamp. And we sang that. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verses, verse 105. But he now is saying, and it's going to be that way until dawn, until the day star comes. And he's talking about the second coming. But the picture is, in between, we live in a murky world. We live in a dark place. We need a lamp. And God's lamp for getting us from here to the second coming is what he's given in scripture. And there's going, and, and I think the way I read this passage is that he's saying, you do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day star until the dawn breaks and the day star arise in your heart. You do well to pay attention in your heart to it until the Lord comes and returns. And then he says, here's why. No prophecy ever came by someone's own interpretation. Now again, scholars go back and forth on this and some say it means you shouldn't interpret the Bible just piecemeal. You need to compare scripture with scripture. That's possible, but I don't think it's what it means here. I think what he means is no prophet, no true prophet given by God ever woke up one morning and say, I think I'll write some prophecy. It didn't come from their own interpretation of events and from their own understanding of the way things were going. It wasn't initiated by them. What happened? Men were moved by the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, one of the Old, Old Testament's primary things was there are false prophets. There are lying prophets. And the mark of a lying prophet is he speaks on his own initiative. He speaks without being sent. And a prophet speaks what God has given him to speak. And so he says, prophet men were moved along by the Holy Spirit. I love that picture because the word that they were born along by the Holy Spirit is used in Acts chapter 27 of a ship with its sails up. And uh, you, you can think of a sailing ship and the, there's, the, there's the ship, the masts are up and the, the sails are up and it just sits there and then the wind comes and the wind moves that ship to the place where it intends. And he says, that's the way the Bible is. It is a book of men. 
It is a book written by human beings. It is written in human words and human vocabulary. Every author has his own style. Every author has his own way of saying particular things. But the moving of that, of that ship, it is a product of men, but the power and the direction and the impetus comes from God himself. Peter, or Paul rather, I mean Paul this time, um, puts it like this. He says, from a child, Timothy, you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise to salvation. For all scripture is God breathed and is profitable. And he, when he uses that expression, God breathed, it means that it's breathed out by God. It finds its source in God himself. The Bible is a God breathed book. It says what God intends it to say. It means what God intends it to mean. And it's sufficient for what God intends it to be sufficient for. It is able to make a person who's a follower of Christ complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in our statement about the Bible, we want to talk on one level about the authority of the Bible. It's authoritative because it's God's word. But we also want to talk about the sufficiency of the Bible. It gives us what God intends us to know. All that we need to know for living a godly life. We don't need the newest edition. We don't need the newer prophecies that people come and tell us. Yes, the Bible says this, but here's more. God's word is authoritative and it is sufficient. So let me just notice as we close something about our stance toward the Bible. There's probably four different stances that you can think of having. There's some people who stand over the Bible and they position themselves so the Bible is here and they've got their three buckets and they say, yes, that goes in there, that goes in that bucket, that goes in that bucket. When you stand over the Bible and you judge on the basis of human reason or your culture or your personal preference, I like what this person says and not that one, where does authority lie? It lies in me. I stand over the Bible and I determine what is true. Others have a stance in which they put others, others stand alongside the Bible. So it's not so much what they're doing with the Bible, it's that they take the Bible, but then they stand that or this or him or her alongside the Bible. And so the Bible becomes one of a panel to which we appeal for certain things. It may be the church as an institution. And so the church is given equal authority with the Bible, as for example in Roman Catholicism where it is the final arbiter of how we interpret the scripture and it has witness over tradition and it brings that to bear alongside it. It may be that we put another book alongside it, as in Mormonism, where we have the, uh, the Book of Mormon put alongside the Bible and the Bible then becomes significant. But you'll notice when people come door to door, they don't come selling you the Bible and the Book of Mormon. There's really only one that they're interested in promoting at that particular place because that's where authority lies. There's other groups that put a person alongside, a prophet who tells you how this is to be interpreted in a particular way and gives you insight. And there's others that put, there's all kinds of things. You can stand alongside the Bible. You can stand on the Bible and this comes closer to the truth. But the danger of standing on the Bible is the Bible becomes the platform for me to use to communicate my ideas and my truth. So often, and, and we know it, there are people who will be ready to quote the Bible for a particular thing, but they carefully choose what part they stand on and use it as a platform for an agenda that is their own. All of this is to say there is only one safe place to stand in relationship to the Bible, and that is to stand under it. To stand under it as recognizing it is authoritative. 
It is directing. My responsibility is to hear it for what God is saying and what he intends it to say. And then to live it out and obey it as he would have me live and out and obey it. That means that we constantly trust, test what we think we are hearing by again standing under it to make sure that we are hearing it correctly and not just to confirm our prejudices or our ideas or our opinions. And we want to be a church that stands under the word of God as the basis of what we believe, as the mission and the message that we want to proclaim, and as giving us the lifestyle of what, um, of what God intends. I um, love the statement that we end the doctrinal statement with. It is stolen from elsewhere, but there's some things are worth stealing. It says, the Bible is the ultimate authority for God's people. It is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. And that's where God calls us to live our lives. Now, if we do not know it, we cannot stand under it. And so it isn't enough just to say, oh yes, I'm a, I, I believe the Bible. We need to stand under it, to hear it in our own lives, and to be taught in ways that help us to understand it better. May God keep us as a church, a church that stands under and for the word of God, to the glory of the center of the word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the written word, the gift of your spirit to us, your people. Help us to live our lives, living your word for the glory of the word, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.